hopefully, uh, I'll talk rather quickly, but hopefully you can understand me. Can you hear me, everybody in the back? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I want to give some special thanks to folks that are in this room and other people. So what I'm going to try to present to you today, as you'll see in a moment, is I'm in a period of my life where I'm a little bit angsty. I'm trying to figure out what my life is about. More importantly, what my science or our lab science is about and where we can make the biggest difference. And a lot of this has come up through conversations with a number of people in this room. I see uh, Michael Rosen's here, of course. Uh, Dr. Saito is here. My old advisor, Charles Goldman, is here, if you don't mind waving Dr. Goldman, who inspired me early on. And so a lot of these conversations recently I've had with him and Alan Havert, my lab group, uh, a, a lot of different folks in this room, uh, Kelly Redmond at DRI, for example, on why are we studying water and what are we really doing? I also want to thank people, as you'll see in a moment, I'll talk quite a bit about some work we've done in Guatemala. I'm not going to talk so much about Mongolia, as I had illustrated in our abstract earlier. Uh, and I want to thank people from USAID and the National Science Foundation for funding this work. So before we start, these are the types of things I wanted to go through today. It is the Student World Water Forum, so I thought we'd just have a moment to celebrate the water molecule. Just a moment. And then I want to talk, and I'll, we'll come back to that in a second, but then I do want to talk to you about the world water crisis. It's a little bit preaching to the choir, I think, but I hope it sets the stage for where my emotional moment is at this point in time in terms of reflecting on how we should go about solving water issues at a global level. And then give you a case study of a more local scaled study studying eutrophication dynamics, cultural eutrophication that is, in Guatemala at a large deep lake there. And then I'll end with some reflections um, indicating what I feel like scientists and engineers, what we need to do to step up our game to make some changes uh, in this world. But also reflect on how we might go about doing that or maybe I'm just not doing it and I need help. I'm hoping you can help me in the audience walk me through this. So let's celebrate this water molecule just for a moment, okay? Just for a little bit of time here. Pretty amazing, amazing thing. So out there in the audience, what is, what is a great physiochemical property of water? What is, the, what, what is Tell me a little bit about water. This is my limnology classes partly in here. What's so amazing about water? Okay, fantastic. So what does that mean in principle for an ecosystem like a lake? Does ice? Right, so that's pretty exciting. Okay, what about, what else? <laughs> Fantastic, and in many cases, it's a great solvent. And it can then take solutes in and dissolve many different substances in it, in it okay, as a compound. What's a great biological property of water? What's exciting about water? What's exciting about water for you? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Basically, it's a pretty amazing thing. It has high heat capacity. Sure, it, ice floats as a result of its density properties, and so lakes don't freeze from the bottom up. But the reality is no known forms of life can serve without water. A little bit goes a long way. This is for everything, whether it's for you, maybe me drinking a little bit of water in just a few minutes, plants, microbes, the whole bit, OK? So this is a good celebration. Everybody clap. This is the water molecule. All right. So we've got the water molecule. We've got a compound. But the reality is I'm going to talk to you about more serious and depressive things now. Because this is what I do. I'm a professor. Right? So I'm going to tell you about the world water crisis. You probably know quite a bit about it. But I hope it sets the stage for where the crisis is today. At least this is how I feel where things are. Here's a map uh, that is often shown to show just in terms of water scarcity or quantity of water for human use, where there's water scarcity on the planet. And if you notice this map, you're going to see water scarcity largely in areas where there's semi-arid places to live and or developing regions of the planet. So a lot of places uh, in Africa, for example, at at least the countrywide scale, South Asia, where my family's from, uh, East Asia, parts of Europe, uh, for example, um, where you'll see water scarcity issues. Close to 3 billion plus people on this planet do not have adequate water resources. 3 billion people. Okay? The footprint for water, this is kind of a, a way of honing in now at thinking, okay, well, the water is scarce, but how are we using water on this planet? Here's our water footprint when there's available data for it. You can clearly see water footprints are large, largely in developing countries, but also in developed countries like the United States. 
a lot of this footprint is related to agriculture. So that's a big component of an industry that causes footprint and water use, at least at the countrywide scale. Again, places like Africa, places like South Asia, a lot of places in Central America I'll talk to, there's large footprints of water and water scarcity there. Another way to think about water, when I was thinking about it, I started wondering, okay, well, these are pretty cool maps, and they're great publications published in our best journal, Science, Nature, PNAS, Water Resources, maybe, from time to time. But the reality is, water and the use of water is inherently complicated. It's just not at a local scale, but just by transferring, transferring goods and commodities across the planet, our use of water, or our virtual water footprint, as it is called, uh, is quite impressive, and it really is country dependent. In this case, you can see water transports, if you take, look at it virtually in terms of goods and commodities, uh, China exports quite a bit of its water. And this was an interesting way for me to start thinking about, whoa, maybe water isn't just the scarcity of a local place, but it's a good and a commodity based on products that you and I buy, our cell phones, from apple that are produced in China, maybe our fruits and vegetables, goods and commodities that are moved around the world, and in some cases, developing countries face the burden and brunt of this type of water footprint, virtual water footprint and water scarcity. If you look at the quality of water, as at least it pertains to billions of people on the planet, quality inherently is tied into what we're putting into that system as a result of, largely because of use, okay? In developing countries, 80% of sewage in developing countries is di discharged directly, untreated, into our water. Yet, many of those communities then have to take that water back out for their own use. Nitrate from agriculture, again, agriculture is a major industry on this planet, puts nitrates back into the water systems. Okay? Contaminated groundwater is quite important. Approximately 3.5 million people a year die each year just from inadequate water supplies or poor water quality. 3.5 million people. Very hard for me to comprehend in this small room. We have great drinking water, but there are people dying daily and yearly just on this fact. I'm an ecologist. I tend to study fisheries production, you know, clarity of lakes, but the fact that there's human loss really is starting to bum me out as a middle-aged scientist now. And it's something that I'm starting to reflect on more and more. What's also important is the biodiversity of these fresh waters is degrading more than any other systems on the planet not terrestrial systems. Freshwater biodiversity is in large decline, as I'll show you in a moment. Here's a map that shows you the changes uh, between 1999, uh, 90 to 99 versus 2000 to 2007, this bottom map here. Pay attention to the red spots and dark red spots. There's increased levels of nitrate contamination in rivers and lakes and groundwater in those regions, but we're making improvements on the quality side. There's a little bit of hope in this picture. We are making, at least at the decadal scale, some improvements in change. If you look at water scarcity and quality, and you combine it with the threats related to biodiversity, they're related hand in hand, and they're often compounded. An excellent paper published in Nature in 2010 clearly showing here where threats are in relation to water security threats. Okay? In red are the highlighted zones. South Asia, East Asia, Central Asia, Africa, parts of Central America. We're very fortunate in North America. We have very good water security, if you will, but in terms of security-based threats to biodiversity, we're still moderate. But in these other locations, they're much higher, as indicated in red. So for me, as a limnologist that loves biodiversity, I start trying, I'm starting to try to connect the water scarcity quality issues with, well, how can I maintain biodiversity within these systems? A number of water-dependent taxa in fresh waters, whether it's amphibians, fishes, are all on the red list. Anyone know what a red list is? IUCN red list? IUCN red list. What is it? Yeah, so this is a global list uh, put out and that's science-based, where it's a list of species that are listed either as threatened endangered or highly endangered. Okay, 38% of these species are threatened with extinction in fresh waters, 38%. 25% um, threatened with extinction for freshwater amphibian species. Uh, species throughout Africa and the Mediterranean basin are highly threatened. This is a bummer. 
get bummed about this? At least I've been starting to get really, really bummed about things like this. In the wake of these challenges of water scarcity and quantity, the one thing we rarely hear, at least ecologists and hydrologists talking about, is the population boom. It's as if we just ignore it these days. It's just a given fact. In 2015, we have 7.3 billion people on the planet. Remember, 3 billion of those people, nearly 40 to 50% don't have adequate water supplies or quality of water. And the population's growing. And when you interview people, at least in this particular study from Pew Research Center, when you interview people and you talk about resources and population growth, largely what happens is the adult population, for example, in the US, feels overall, well, you know what, uh, there won't be enough food resources, but really we'll find a way to make it happen. Versus it's scientists out there that, that are more conscious and knowledgeable that say, there's a big problem out here. But why aren't we getting that message out to people? This is what I'm starting to struggle with. The common person, why aren't we getting a message out there? What are we doing in the wake of population booms that, are, that is influencing our messaging that's out to people? And yet, if you look again at these maps, and you look at where the populations could grow the most, where there's the highest fertility rates, for example, they're in these developed areas. In Africa, and parts of Asia, Middle East, or in Central America. So our biodiversity issues and our scarcity and quality issues are gonna get far worse in this crisis. And I, I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. You can hear the tone in my voice being a little bit upset about it. We've just celebrated the water molecule. Come on, this is a pretty cool molecule. What's going on? What it's got me to think about is when I was an undergraduate, and this is a, uh, what I wanted to say to people who are young scholars in here. Uh, I met an advisor who's sitting in the room here today from UC Davis, and I heard a talk on campus, and it was something he had presented at that period of time talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. And in this case, Dr. Goldman, if you don't mind raising your hand, all right, announces there is going to be a fifth horseman of the apocalypse, one with water shortages, scarcity, and biodiversity loss, and it's coming quickly. Now, that was about 20 years ago, and it's sad for me to say this, but at least in my investigations of going to Pakistan with Laurel or maybe going to Mongolia or Bhutan or India or Central America, I guess I'm having this angst on my inside as a scientist, and I'm starting to feel, I am feeling the fifth horseman of the apocalypse the water scarcity and quality, it's here. It's here. It has arrived. It's not going to happen. It, is, it has happened. So what are we going to do here? Here's the fifth horseman carrying a bucket of wasted water. What are we doing as scientists? I don't know. But there's some hope, and there's a lot of debate out there now with how we might address these issues, whether it's from the governance approach or maybe the technological feet that we have achieved and how we can push forward. And the debate, this is a great issue that was just out in Science in July 2015, talking about what scale of water governance do we need to work at to solve these issues? Do we need to go global and then come in local? Have these international programs that are set up, we have international knowledge, we have governance structures to try to understand transfers of water and the quality of water. Or do we, should we work, um, in this case, from a local perspective? The idea behind going global is, remember those commodities? They're being moved across the country and across the globe. And its countries influence each other based on their virtual water footprint, not just from the local sourcing of the water. But the argument to work local, which happens to appeal to me a little bit more, maybe because my small little mind can work around this, is that local perspectives of water are so important. You have to involve local people with decision making. That's where the water gets used initially. That's where solutions can be had um, initially. And in this particular paper, in response to the local perspectives on water, the bureaucratic strategies that big agencies produce, aid and development companies, the United Nations, are so bureaucratic at this global level that we would never get anything to the people that are on the ground. This has really got me thinking a lot these days. I'm, I'm the type of person that tends to go local. And so this is the type of reflection I'm having. So now I'm gonna just switch into a local story, a story where my colleagues and I 
we've been able to go down to Lake Atitlan in Guatemala, as I'll tell you about the lake in just a second, and address cultural eutrophication issues, or should I say try to address them there, working at a local-based governance framework and a local-based scientific solution framework. This, after all, is what typically we do as scientists and engineers. It's much easier to scale things at a more local level. So I'm going to tell you the story here in the next maybe 15, 20 minutes or so. And then I'm going to give you a little reflections on whether I think going local is the way to go, um, at least in my heart of hearts. So here's Lake Atitlan. How many of you have been to Lake Atitlan in Central America? Anybody? Raise your hands high. Yeah, amazing place. It is Central America's largest, deepest lake. So beautiful. Very few boats on the lake, mostly locals there in these little rowboats. It's a volcanic terminal lake described by DV, an early limnologist, as oligotrophic. So oligotrophic, not a productive ecosystem. Relatively clean and clear. Located in the highlands of Central America here, uh, about two hours from Guatemala City. It's very similar to Tahoe in some respects, or maybe Crater Lake up in Oregon. It has these three large flanking volcanoes in its watershed. As I'll tell you in a little bit, uh, a little bit more, it's got two major rivers coming in to it. It's a young lake, 85,000 years old or so. So it shouldn't be too productive uh, by historical context. Okay? Uh, it's the largest drinking water source for this watershed. Okay? Uh, it's local area, uh, local resources, the fish, the snails, the crabs, they're all used by a majority of the local inhabitants for crafts and for food. And now it's a tourism-supported economy. Lake Atitlan's a pretty amazing spiritual place if you ever get to go there. It's deeply ingrained in a lot of rich historical culture. So it has three different Mayan ethnic groups that live in this region, highlighted with these different color here. Kachikel, the Quiche people, and the Tutsu Hill. There's about 400,000 inhabitants or so that live within the watershed, largely of this Mayan community descent. There's three different states or departments. So managing or trying to understand pollution of this water, it's not totally complicated. There's three states and it's in one country. So how complicated could it get, right? Uh, relatively low population density uh, in this case, and about 33% of the watershed is urban. All right. It's been impacted from human activity, from Mayan culture, we think for about 3,000 years based on the archaeological evidence that's there. Here is the beauty of that country. I mean, people of different Mayan descent with be just beautiful colors, for example, colorations. I showed this in my class earlier this week or two weeks ago, guys with funny pants. I always love that photo. These pants are pretty rocking. All right, very colorful people, excited to be out there, drinking water, using the lake as a resource. For centuries, the system seemed to be in balance. Even with 3,000 years of development or use within the watershed, the human population seemed to live within equilibrium with those three communities of Mayan cultures that are there, for, whether for washing clothes, uh, using the water for drinking water for young children. But over time, as we've developed the watershed, the watershed, uh, there's been influences and impacts into the system. And these types of impacts are very common. They're the kind of impacts that we'd see up at Lake Tahoe, right in our backyard in some cases or in other lakes around the globe. In the 1960s, there was the introduction of black bass uh, from Pan American Airways, so a large airline. And the idea was to create a big fishery there. So in this case, Pan American Airways, for those of you, I don't know if you remember, some of you were kids, you probably got Pan American Airways or Braniff cards, playing cards, I did at least when I was growing up. Pretty amazing airline, took people around the world, and then also wanted to bring people to places, but modified the tourism industry by putting in bass. Well, it turns out this highly predatory species tended to prey on the lake's only endemic grebe, uh, a wingless bird called the patapoke. And so this bird eventually goes extinct over time. Uh, in 1976, there was a large volcanic activity that caused the lake itself just to drop three to a half meters or so. It's a very dynamic zone there. And for these types of historical things, there's an interesting book for those of you who like romance, excitement, and also Civil War mixed with, if you're thinking about Peace Corps, this is a great book to read. This is Mama Polk. This is Anne La Bastille, before she passed away, wrote a book 
about her experiences in Guatemala during this period. And the idea that the lake is an intimate resource for the people, but it's only in recent activity that we're seeing big changes at the lake, like biodiversity loss. And at the, in her book, she didn't describe the lake as being eutrophic, as I'll describe in a moment. Other events that altered Atitlan. In 2005 and 2010, we're having the increased frequency of tropical storms and hurricanes come through this region. Climate scientists suggest this is an advent of what will, this is what will happen more and more throughout the Central American region and in, uh, as a result of shifts in climate. And so Hurricane Stan and Agatha resulted in mass wasting of the watershed. Uh, roads were removed, uh, big rivers flood, move lots of sediment load into the system. Hurricane Agatha, which came a little later, destroyed the secondary wastewater treatment plant for the, one of the main urban centers that has about 25% of the population in the watershed. And this then results in directed sewage right into the lake. So these types of issues are going to occur on, on, a, on a more frequent basis than they're occurring now. We're also having increases of atmospheric loading within the basin. If you talk to the older Mayan communities, they would always talk about clean, clean, crisp air. And just within the last 15 to 20 years, people are talking about increased pollution like this within the atmosphere, largely from crop burning, uh, burning of corn crops within the region of Central America. And the winds tend to take it, take it and travel it to Lake Atitlan. Right? So in the 1970s, up until today, we've had this, those hurricanes are like these big presses or pulses of change. But there's been this short-term press, and this is very common again throughout developing countries and rivers and lakes around the world. We export our sewage and our waste into waterways directly. And since the 1970s, since the development of the watershed, we've had increasing treated and untreated sewage coming right into the lake. Uh, here's an example of that. Here's a pipe from one of the main urban centers just flowing right into the lake, into the boat dock and swimming area uh, of this system. Uh, there's been 2,500 metric tons of garbage that are estimated to come into the lake on a yearly basis. And you can actually start seeing this garbage manifest itself in the center of the lake in these giant gyres that are in the lake. What happened is in December 2008, after this long-term press of sewage coming into the lake and these changes in the watershed, in December 2008, we saw our first cyanobacteria bloom in the lake. Remember I told you Charles Deavy suggested that the lake was oligotrophic, so it should be non-productive, pretty clear lake. Uh, and here are some examples of that algal bloom. People out there with nets trying to scoop up the algae, thinking they can remediate the algae fairly quickly just by removing it, yet the algal growth was very, very high. There's a little bit of panic in the watershed, right? These are local resources that are, being, that are changing quickly, uh, large soupy green water. Interviews when we went there with the local Mayan fishermen suggested uh, actually, this may have occurred in the past, uh, and from the mother's mother had suggested that. Now, I don't know if this is true, but for me, this is kind of exciting as a scientist, because you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, maybe these lakes can take these big, steep changes rather quickly. I don't know. That hasn't borne itself out, but those are the types of questions we can answer, maybe with a little paleolimnology. Should we believe that the lake had turned green in the past? There's no evidence that a large, deep lake at 320 meters deep with a young watershed would be eutrophic, okay? There's been very little research at this lake, despite being an icon for Central America. Very, very few studies have been conducted there. Definitely very little interannual variation in data collected from the system. And in this tropical mountain deep lake, globally, they're kind of these odd lakes. They're these mountain lakes with tropical dynamics. And so we don't often understand mixing process within these systems. What we do know from the bloom period using satellite data is that this bloom picked up rather quickly in October 2009. Here's November 2009. Uh, here is the 22nd. At least for the surface water, within an approximately two month period, month and a half, 45 day period, you get the advent of a very large algal bloom with gyres in the center of the lake. This elicited a major response from the vice president of Guatemala. The vice president of Guatemala is in charge of environmental resources. That's how their political system is structured there. And you see all sorts of things in their major newspapers. The lake is in a coma. The lake is dead. There's a ca catastrophe at the lake. Imagine if we went to Yellowstone and there was a giant fire that came through Yellowstone. How would we react 
that happened, right? And we were pretty devastated. People are sort of watching out for Yellowstone 15 years ago and saying, what's a fire going to do to this national park? Well, this is essentially a fire within their national park. There's a lot of controversy. People calling the lake dead. By March 2009, a nonprofit group called Todos por el Lago comes together, one of the main local NGOs. And they're basically trying to figure out what is going on with this lake. It's always been, at least mostly, been clear and clean for us. And there's rumor existing as to all sorts of rumors of why the lake is turned green. There are rumors like magical activity. Uh, that had come up a number of times. Climate, shifts in climate are maybe causing thermal properties of the water increase. Or maybe it's just a natural dynamic. Don't worry. The lake can purify itself. Um, after this meeting, because there was this demand to do something about it, you should have seen there was a bunch of people that came out thinking, OK, well, we should put magical potions in the lake. We should use magical chemistry. Let's just dump this into a large deep lake and clean it up. Maybe we'll put solar bees out there, giant wind devices to try to mix the lake. I call this the sort of the bamboozling time of scientists and engineers. It really bums me out that someone doesn't sit back and actually say, can you really solve the problem of a large deep lake by putting lots of chemicals in it? We should know better than that. That's never been done on the planet in an accurate way. Yet, Guatemalans were eating this stuff up, dumping hundreds of thousands of dollars into those approaches initially, the vice president included there, because they didn't know better. All right, so the vice president declares this lake dead. And by declaring it dead, it had ramifications for the fisheries community there. Fishing communities that receive $1 to $2 a day, nobody would eat the fish. Restaurants wouldn't buy it. People didn't have local economy, at least the fishermen. In October 2009, we see a second more sustained bloom. The bloom that I'm talking about, as I'll point out in a second, is largely of a genus called Limnorephus that we discovered there. And then it's April 2010, we start seeing the convergence of a second bloom with microcystis. Microcystis tends to bloom to, uh, produce toxins within the system. And by 2010, you see small blooms occurring. And then 13 and 14, minor blooms, and again, 2015, just a few months ago, another bloom. Here's what the blooms look like from the same location. You can see it's a highly dynamic system. So some people freak out in 2008 and 9 because the lake is covered with a lot of algae. By 2010, they're saying the lake is purifying itself. By 2012, there's discussion, oh, well, maybe it doesn't purify itself. But there's just not enough science there to suggest why this would be occurring. And that's the key aspect here. So we responded. There was a group of people largely led from my colleague at UC Davis, grateful to her, Dr. Alishka Romenkova, who was down there during the bloom. And she came back and she said, there is big trouble here in Guatemala. And this is their iconic system with ancient Mayan cultures. We need to do something. So with funding from the National Science Foundation and some private Guatemalan donors, we took a group of people down, uh, including some folks from DRI, like Professor Alan Havert, who's in the room. And we initiated a set of trainings trainings to do basic sampling. What does it mean to only sample the surface water of your lake versus the bottom of the lake for nutrients? Maybe we should sample the watershed. Um, and so we did this initial set of trainings, and then we received money from USAID development, basically, to continue these trainings and to uh, try to understand dynamics of the lake, and, so, and to engage in sort of active participation and solutions with the local people. So this is a response to the blooms. We're really grateful to USAID because USAID ended up giving us funding to go down there and work within the local capacity to build on existing projects and programs to try to do the following things. Try to, or to train future generation of young scientists to carry out monitoring and communicate the results. We didn't want to just collect stuff and put it on the shelf. Develop long-term scientifically based monitoring program. Remember, I just told you, we, don't, we didn't even have basic monitoring data for this lake, even though it's Central America's icon. Temperature, clarity, chemistry, biology, all the stuff that many of you, at least in my class here in limnology, we've just started to learn now. And we've been doing it down there. Create a sustainable environmental water quality lab. This was a fun activity for us, a little stressful, but the idea that we need to develop on the ground capacity to measure these types of things, biological change, chemical and physical, by setting up a laboratory there. Um, pull different agencies together. This is surprising. The climate agency never really talked to the Management Water Authority, and they had some temperature data, for example. 
Um, the NGO may have been collecting biological data, but wasn't reporting it to the federal government. And so our goal was to interview the different agencies and pull together some of the data to see what quality data there might be over time. And then the key part is transfer this information to policymakers. Every time we went down, almost every three weeks, we would meet with the vice president, president of Guatemala, or local regional governors, or local mayors to transfer the information, uh, to tell them what was happening with their lake. So, we basically developed a capacity development program, very common when you are funded from USAID to do this, where we take students out, conduct these little biological assays. I'll show you some of that data in a moment. Uh, count phytoplankton. We uh, rented these really cool party boats where we could put giant speakers on while we were working. Pretty exciting times. You should come out and work with us. Again, boats that didn't have wench systems, so we had designed the physical devices to actually go down 300 meters to the bottom of the lake to collect samples. Very important. Um, here's the wenching style system. Simple capacity. Manual labor. Basically dropping lines 1,000 feet within the water, pulling it back up. Here's some dredges where we collected bottom sediments for chemistry and for invertebrates mostly. Document changes. What do we end up finding? So there's some really cool properties here. Remember the vice president and the locals declaring the, the lake is dead. The lake is dead. And instead, it was very much alive. It had this algal bloom that the locals and the vice president suggested could have toxins, because someone told them there's got to be toxic algae as a result of this. Well, it turns out some of our science investigations ended up finding out that the bloom that was occurring was a cyanobacteria called, we were identifying it initially as something called lingbia. But it was actually a new genus of discovery of algae. It's called limnorhaphis robusta. So it was pretty exciting discovering our colleague from the Czech Republic discovers a new genus of cyanobacteria that seems to be blooming in, the, blooming in the region. We conducted some genetic workups of the actual bloom. And it turns out this particular cyanobacteria genus doesn't have a toxin producing component to it. It doesn't have genes for it. So the declarations of causing something to be dead had economic ramifications to local people, but there was no science to support that. So this was nice. It was great to get that out there to say, your lake is not dead, and at least now not poisoning people just yet. Here's what happened when we collected data related to clarity. Clarity clearly is a very important governing property and structure uh, for lake ecosystems. Here's the dry season versus wet season on the bottom. Here's a disk that you lower into the water to measure clarity called a secchi disk and time. This is the best available data we could find, and you'll notice there's only two or three historical periods of clarity that were measured from the lake. And clearly, the dry season is being influenced the most. The algal growth seems to be really taking off here in the last four to five years. But prior to that, however much sewage was loading into the system wasn't manifesting itself as a response into that system. The other thing we noticed is there's very little data in the wet season. And the wet seasons for tropical lakes can be primers for productivity by delivering nutrients and particles. And so our recommendations in the monitoring program were you can't just go onto the lake during a happy day when it's all dry. You've got to set up programs that go out during different seasons. And that's indeed what we're doing now. Oxygen's pretty interesting for controlling lake ecosystems. It controls redox dynamics, the availability of phosphorus for internal loading. It also uh, controls habitat for fisheries. By mining data, we were able to figure out the lake actually, at least initially, had very high oxygen con concentrations in the bottom of the lake in the hypolimnion in the 60s, taken with classic Winkler measurements. But over time, at least since our measurements were there, we're seeing a precipitous decline in oxygen at the bottom of the lake. Here's an example of that. Uh, here is data of temperature and oxygen in April 2014. And basically, anything below 200 meters or so is starting to go into the anoxic zone. That's a large volume of water. That's about 40% of the volume of the lake itself, containing lots of low oxygen and high phosphorus concentrations. So when the lake mixes again, here's an example of the nutrients. Again, these are data that hadn't been collected before in this lake. Here are the relatively high nutrient phosphorus and ammonium concentrations. We're able to suggest to the policymakers, this is why you need to profile the whole lake. You can't just go collect the surface water. It's only telling you the pulse of the system not what's about to happen as a result of nutrient buildup at the bottom of the lake. So we were also trying to set up connections then with this program between not just lake monitoring and measuring the health and pulse of a lake, but what's happening within the watershed. Here's our colleague Kevin Rose, who came out at that time from Washington, D.C. 
And we were starting to take transect measurements from the river all the way out into the center of the lake to, to look at connectivity between the sediment loading from the lake, which contains phosphorus, and different areas in the lake. Here's turbidity, for example, when you get close to shore, similar to what you'd see in this photo, very high turbidity, high sediment particles. But as you go offshore, about a mile, mile and a half, this is when you start seeing turbidity curtains, uh, sorry, turbidity levels move towards the bottom of the lake containing high phosphorus levels around 10 to 12 meters. So if you look at this then from a particle distribution, but also from the type of players that are in the system biologically, what we ended up finding, everybody kept asking us, the lake's not going to bloom again. I don't think it's going to bloom again. And we kept suggesting, well, probably good to monitor the whole depth of the lake because these things, biological properties tend to, tend to live within deeper depths of a system and the thermocline levels at the deeper areas. And in this particular case, high turbidity in the 10 to 12 meter range, but you'll notice here around 20 to 25 meters where there's stratification in the lake, a whole variety of community composition of different algal players there. Green algae, diatoms, but then some cyanobacteria, basically resting for optimal nutrient conditions and mixing in the lake uh, for them to come back. If you look at this in more detail between 2013 and 2014, for example, a lot of varying dynamics of algal dynamics within this deep lake. Uh, in particular, you'll see um, a lot of resting algae at the thermocline. This is a very common property in stratified lake ecosystems. What's uncommon is to have this type of data within a large deep tropical lake, let alone just in Guatemala. And in particular, highly variable across seasons. These are the years we didn't see many big blooms, and so everyone kept thinking the lake is healing itself. There's not a lot of algae within the system. We shouldn't worry about it. So what we kept getting is this answer that treated sewage is not, is not to be a problem. Don't worry. We can treat sewage. If we, build, if we rebuild a treatment plant, we can put sewage back into the system. It can, it, there's not going to be a problem at all because the treatment plants themselves are able to purify water uh, at, at very good concentrations. And we were a little skeptical of that. Both our science and engineering colleagues there were saying, well, your treatment can only go so far, and the lake is a closed basin. So it's a matter of reactor rates and times of change before you'll see another algal bloom. So what we did is we worked with the local community and we started conducting these assays in, in garbage barrels. We would basically work with the resources that we had, got these garbage bins, filled them with lake water, and added various nutrients within the system, nitrogen, phosphorus, nitrogen plus phosphorus, and sewage. And this was to do two things. It was to A, to try to understand what nutrient is limiting the lake, because there was a discussion and an argument on whether it was phosphorus from the sewage treatment plants or maybe nitrogen from rains, and then whether sewage had an issue. And here for us, when we do this across multiple seasons, clearly you add sewage into a barrel and you'll see a lot of algal growth. This is both treated and untreated. Yeah, so in this particular case, this can be treated. Um, as I'll show you in a moment, we have a great laboratory right next to a sewage treatment plant. So it's kind of fun for our students to walk right over and get treated sewage. And experiments. A great laboratory. Okay, so it's one thing to have locals looking at barrels that turn green. They can far, start, finally start connecting dissolved connections, dissolved nutrients in water coming out of these sewage plants actually resulting in algal growth. Um, but people were starting to ask us about heterotrophs or bacterial processing rates of carbon within the system. And this is another sort of classic experiment that typically gets set up in polluted systems where you can add nitrogen and phosphorus and then you can add carbon, just glucose or sewage, and see what stimulates productivity. Again, a no-brainer here, you can stimulate bacterial production just by adding sewage into a system. But this is something at the local level they didn't have. Yet, there have been thousands of experiments globally that have done something similar. And when we explained to them, we don't need to do these experiments, but if you want to, we can show you what happens. They were like, yes, let's do it locally. We want to know what happens. The key part here is what we ended up finding is it wasn't the open water that was processing the sewage. It was actually the nearshore zone. The nearshore part of this lake is a really important dynamic area, a lot of substrate contract, uh, contact. And in this particular case, you get more carbon respired in these littoral zone areas in different months versus maybe the open water. So these are the pre-processing areas of the lake. If we're going to manage the areas of the lake for wetlands, we want to manage the edge of these lakes and restore them to try to prevent uh, introductions of nutrients. This is our student, Alicia, who is down there who conducted these experiments. We're grateful for her for that. The other thing we noticed is when we went through our long-term data collections, which was agonizing, contacting all these agencies, is there wasn't a proper loading estimate 
of nutrients coming from the lake. So a very important watershed for people, yet there weren't good discharge measurements or good nitrogen phosphorus chemical measurements. So we spent a year in the, three, the different sub-basins of the watershed collecting uh, load and uh, discharge information, just to try to get estimates of what is the major watershed or watersheds that are loading nutrients into the lake. And we ended up finding that there's two major watersheds that load, and the other ones are largely minor in their runoff into the system. So if we're focusing monitoring programs, we should likely focus them on the large watersheds that can put lots of sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus into a system. All of this information gets put together, and this is what's kind of the agonizing part of my heart. These are the same types of studies we've done at Lake Tahoe, that Dr. Goldman has done, for example, or that we've done in Europe, yet we're having to do it all over again in a new location, rather than use existing literature to show what could happen. And so we take all of this information, and our colleague from uh, Chico State University, Stuart Oakley, and some local engineers, we have moved to the direction of let's not rebuild sewage treatment plants within the basin and put them in. Let's collect the sewage and export them out of the system. If we can do anything here, it's important to have long-term intervention with the system here because the costs of maintaining plants in the system where there's very little energy, uh, regular energy, and energy costs a lot of money, is going to far outpace um, what we can actually do if we had exported the system. So we've provided an alternative. We've been working with engineers there now to create what's called the Tubo Project, to collect water and sewage and sanitation around the lake and to move it around the basin and export it from the region. And we've done these very, very preliminary calculations, but calculations to see if we can generate uh, energy from some of the waste and operate the electricity to move it out of the basin. Here's the lowest point in the basin at the southeastern end of the lake is one of the locations we're proposing to export the sewage where the head is the lowest there uh, and, and generate electricity. We end up doing this sort of variations of treatments because what's happening from the consultants that were coming in internationally is they were suggesting, oh, you don't need to export sewage. We need to just build tertiary treatment plants within this watershed. And for those of you who are in the engineering world, you know how expensive it is to maintain tertiary treatment. And these are local poor communities. They cannot afford that, um, even if a loan is given initially to build them. We do these very preliminary cost estimates. For example, uh, if you discharge sewage directly to the lake after you've built a sewage treatment plant, uh, with secondary treatment at least, the cost of electricity is so high there that your operating costs would the burden would be placed on the local community and they wouldn't be able to operate the plant. It's most likely the plant would end up shutting down versus if you can take the water and export it to coffee growers as a private partnership, we might be able to bring some of that, or we will be able to bring some of that funding back to operate the plant and to generate uh, the energy there. So a second thing we did then after collecting these nutrients is we've developed, we've tried to develop these partnerships that are private to facilitate changes there at the local level. Um, a, a gentleman who had built one of the wastewater treatment plants was pretty excited with what we did, so he ended up donating one of his houses on the lake as a little laboratory. And so we built this little lab, it's a nice little living room with a fireplace, uh, and we've, this is where we've been training our students. Here's a view from outside the living room right here. If you guys wanna come down, there's a swimming pool we can fill with sewage and do experiments. Here's the lake of a nice volcano, it's a magnificent place to work. And this is really, for me, was one of the more gratifying things to come down as a scientist and to have someone donate property just to move a little bit of the conservation movement forward down there. The other spin-off that ended up happening out of all the students that we trained here over time, they ended up spinning off into a student group uh, called Hun Hila, uh, and they basically are a group of students of different backgrounds, chemical backgrounds, biology, university backgrounds, NGO trainees, and they've created, in their own words, uh, a collaborative group with a mission to strengthen the Guatemalan capacity to monitor Atitlan, promote social decision-making based on science information, and educate community members on the importance of environmental management for their own welfare. Um, uh, Hunila is conceived as a multidisciplinary organization that becomes accessible, an accessible center point in the information network uh, that government agencies and NGOs feed, so on and so forth. I have to say, this may have been the proudest moment I've ever had in my life, seeing some trainees basically take some energy and say, we are going to carry this forward. 
and we'll do it by integrating research within the system. That's a little story of mine, at least. This is what I've been spending the last year and a half to year and three quarters of my life on uh, rather intensely, but as a local scale project. Remember that conversation we just had, of, or, I, or I was mentioning to you about whether should we be acting globally to try to understand water scarcity or, or quality, or should we be acting local? And this is something that I'm struggling with these days, because now as I look back at the project we just implemented uh, for the last two and a half years, I'm starting to realize what was happening down there with our colleagues, and then what happens up here when I work up at Lake Tahoe, is a scientist, we always step back from these decision-making processes. We collect data, and then we say, here's the data, go off and make your own decision. I don't like that anymore. I guess I'm starting to feel a little bit more like we are stakeholders also. We're very knowledgeable stakeholders. We know how much nutrients should be able to fill a system. We also know that there's certain things we can't do to solve water crises, at least at the local level. And we need to be honest with doing things like that. So my feeling is, as scientists, we need to be more active and convey and suggest implementation projects to policymakers to change things at local scales. But I also think the lesson I've learned from here more and more is we have to foster private engagement. Economists out there and policymakers will always tell you that. How many of you are policymakers or an economist? Social, how many of you work in the social dimension? Raise your hands high, be proud. You're extremely unique. And to a room of scientists in here, we don't get that. We don't get the idea often that we need to engage private stakeholders. They're the ones making decisions to make change. And so I would like to advocate to you as science and engineers, take your research beyond one step and engage a stakeholder that might find it interesting. Not just defending your thesis, but actually sharing the passion with them of why you've learned something and what it could do to help them. Because I think you'll find a very positive response that they'll end up donating houses to try to help you out. They'll end up donating equipment. They'll definitely be more engaged, at least at the policymaker level. The other thing I think is very important is seeing is believing. As scientists, we have to work within communities that we serve. I say that with humility if I can, but we serve these communities because we have knowledge and we have information. And we're not just informing the public about research. Here's an example of that. These are the alcaldes, the mayors of the Atitlan watershed. They were talking about this algal bloom and the issues that they have there and the toxins and the fishermen not getting money. We were explaining to them through our experiments, help us out and we'll show you what's causing the change. So we'd load barrels with sewage and nutrients and we'd explain what's happening. It turns out the alcaldes had never looked under a microscope just to understand what the algae was. And I think these little parts of engagement, which is sharing what you know in a very small way goes a long way. They were, look at this guy, he's like, wait a minute, there's something this tiny that ends up covering my whole lake? They were so shocked. And they become active participants. Sharing it with young people, very exciting in this community. Young people seem to always know that the sewage is causing the problem, yet the mayors didn't. Fascinating. We met regularly on a weekly basis when we were down there with local governing officials to talk about the science data and changes that were happening. So, my feeling is, I think the fifth horseman of the apocalypse is here. I think some of you probably think that too, yet we don't talk about it. We're continuing to try to solve problems, but we're willing to always step away uh, to conduct the same old type of studies that we always do. This is starting to agonize my heart just a little bit. Um, for example, cultural eutrophication, we've studied this thing to death globally since the 1930s. There was a whole program, the International Biological Program, that addressed part of this in the 60s and 70s. There have been whole lake experiments that have shown that you add poop into water and it grows algae. Why do we have to keep doing these experiments in new local, er you know, place-based areas? What is it about humanity that we have to do the same experiment? I'm going to be a little controversial and suggest I think we're part of the problem as scientists and engineers. I think we receive funding to do these small projects rather than going to the literature and sharing information to say, maybe you should just go look at somebody else's lake. This has happened before. I'm part of this problem too. And so are we pushing out far enough as scientists and engineers to do something novel and exciting?
This is a question that I'm asking myself after spending a year and a half down at, at, at or a couple years down in Guatemala doing the same studies. So this is my angst. This is my guayasamine art, if you will. And it's basically saying, am I pushing myself far enough to do something novel in science? And I'll have to answer that question with a little Debbie Downer saying, I am not. But I can if I have good people to work with and we can dream and think bigger. So I want to thank you for letting me share a local place-based story and hope that you will push your science harder and share that information with the people that make these decisions. Thanks.